And then he was spat out, literally sort of thrown out at the surface. And because of all the air pressure that expanded in his dry suit, literally shot out fins first into the air, according to the eyewitnesses. And so I spent the last two years making a film about what happens to a human being who experiences one of the most frightening things that can possibly happen to anyone and and who gets thrust into the international news media. And there was no freedom of speech where people would go to prison for saying things that violated government ideology or offended government officials. And, and I did that until I succeeded in pissing off the government officials to the, they had enough of me. In fact, what happened was and took me away on their old Soviet style Lada and drove. Welcome to the Adventure Diaries podcast, where we share tales of adventure, connection and exploration. From the smallest of creators to the larger than life adventurers, we hope their stories inspire you to go create your own extraordinary adventures. And now your host, Chris Watson. Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. Today, my guest is David Abel, an award-winning seasoned journalist at the Boston Globe. David is also a documentary filmmaker and an all-round brilliant storyteller. His career is filled with captivating stories, from winning a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of those impacted by the Boston Marathon bombings, to covering the plight of the North Atlantic right whales and including the incredible story of Michael Packard, who was swallowed whole by a whale and then spat back out. His reporting covers not only the landmark events, but also the human and wildlife impacts too, expertly navigating the sensitivities of such environmental and social crises. So settle in, enjoy some adventure and misadventure in this fantastic conversation with David Abel. David Abel, welcome to the Adventure Diaries. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a pleasure, and I've been really glad to secure your time today. I've been really excited about this conversation and some of the kind of environmental and natural world content which will come on to. So before we, would you want to just maybe give us a bit of an intro in your own words and how you got into the world of journalism and documentary filmmaking? Sure. So let's see how I got into the world of telling stories for a living. First of all, it's a privilege and and a great honor to be able to, to tell stories for a living. And I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do when I was in college. And I, I studied philosophy and political science. And I like to say that it left me with a hunger to repair the world, but no actual skills to do that. And and I moved from the Midwest in the United States after college to San Francisco, where I started writing and writing poetry and working on a novel. And, and after a while of doing that, it felt like I needed to reach beyond myself and really learn how to tell stories in a non solipsistic way. And and there were this confluence of events that came together. One day, there was a visit to San Francisco by this Russian ultra nationalist by the name of Vladimir Zhirinovsky. And, and some people at that point thought, he might be the next leader of Russia. I think this was before Vladimir Putin took power. And and to make a long story short, he gave this speech that was filled with all this racist, bombastic mm. language. And at the end, there was this guy that went to the microphone to ask a question. And he had shaggy hair and he was wearing an old blazer with elbow patches. And he proceeded to ask the most piercing uh questions that that it really impressed me and left a mark on my mind and made me think i want to do that and he of course was a reporter for the local newspaper and and then around the same time i was reading a novel by the late 
recently late Czech novelist Milan Kundera. And in this novel, Kundera had this chapter called The Eleventh Commandment. And it was all about how, in his words, thou shalt answer the journalist's question. And there was this notion, at least in this in the novel that he wrote, that in a democracy there there's this sort of privileged and special caste of people, the journalists, who have this rare position to ask very personal and exacting and difficult questions of people from all walks of life, whether public officials or the homeless. And and it, it, it was a way of learning about the world to me that didn't make you seem creepy because you were expected to ask questions. And Milan Kundera considered a question like a bridge to understanding. And that really resonated with me. And so I ended up deciding to apply to a few journalism programs and and I did a master's in journalism and then uh, then started working at a newspaper, my first newspaper in Mexico City, where I spent about a year uh, learning the ropes of journalism, um, uh, where I often spent um, uh, uh, the day writing uh, about all kinds of major protests and, and written about so many protests at that point against the authoritarian, then very authoritarian government in Mexico, that I was almost ready to join the Zapatistas, this sort of indigenous rebel group that was rising up at that point. But I can keep going, but maybe I'll stop <laughs> there. Uh, yeah. So so on the, the study of, when you decided to pick up the study of journalism, how did that, because journalism and storytelling do they go hand in hand or are, are they very distinct disciplines? Because there are some journalists that don't tell great stories at all. They just report the facts. But I think your work really tells the story, especially the human interest story. So where did the storytelling angle come from? Yeah, we I guess journalists come at the profession from different for different reasons. And telling stories was always a big a big source of of interest for me in working as a journalist but you know there are lots of different kinds of stories and different stories serve different purposes and there's no question that some stories require deep narrative threads and arcs and other stories are just the facts other stories are about holding the government to account casting light in dark places so for me, what makes a story compelling is often in the detail and many stories to really rise above require us to understand the characters that we're writing about deeply. Hmm. Okay. Rolling back again to your time, you're thinking Central America, did I read something about you were almost deported? from Cuba, or, or you did get deported from Cuba for, for some, some, some of your storytelling? Yes. So I stopped at Mexico, but after I left Mexico, I ended up moving to the central highlands of the Dominican Republic because there was a kind of coup d'etat on my family's then pepper farm. But that's a really long story, and I spent about six months trying to take care, put down the coup and help my father out, even though I knew nothing about farming. And and then ended up going back to journalism, although there was a brief moment where I had to make a decision. I was like 22 or 23. I had just left my first journalism job and suddenly found myself running this pepper farm in this very beautiful mountainous area in the Dominican Republic where I had a star fruit tree in my front yard. I had access to horses. I had a shiny red motorcycle. And every morning, this woman brought me a freshly brewed smoothie with a kiss on my cheek. And, <laughs> and it was not a bad deal. <laughs> and I gave some serious thought to maybe staying on, continuing to do that. But I had just started off this career as a reporter and a writer, and this was this felt like my path. And so 
when things got in order, I ended up leaving and going to work for my first newspaper in the States, in South Florida, where I covered a small community on the edge of the Everglades. And and that was a really instructive experience where I got to see how, excuse me, I got to see how we as human beings could radically transform such a wild. And after about a year of doing that and covering the police beat, I sort of was yearning to go back to Latin America. And it seemed at that point, this was in the late 90s, that there was an opening in Cuba. And and I went with a girlfriend for a week to Cuba where Americans typically are not allowed at that point. But there's a gray zone because if you're a reporter, the US government at that point was happy for you to go. And it was easy for you to get authorization to go, or you didn't actually need authorization. You just had to show you were a journalist. But from the Cuban point of view, they were eager to have American tourists, but not necessarily American journalists. So I went to Cuba as a writer and and my girlfriend at the time and I hatched a plan to quit our jobs in South Florida and move to Cuba. She chickened out and I'm and I went. <laughs> and and I spent about six months doing all the kinds of things that I think a lot of reporters dream about, which is which is essentially casting light on on a place where there was no freedom of speech, where people would go to prison for for saying things that violated government ideology or offended government officials. And and I did that until I succeeded in pissing off the government officials <laughs> to the point that they had enough of me. In fact, what happened was I left and come back and I come back to write about the first legal celebration of Christmas and the 40th, I think what was then going to be the 40th anniversary of the revolution. And and I was in the country for less than 24 hours. And it seemed that the person that I felt really badly, actually, the woman who stamped my passport and allowed me into the country was with the police who came to find me. And I'm not sure exactly how they found me, but they found me the next morning and, and took me away on their old Soviet style Lada and drove me back to the airport and detained me until I, I left. But I was still able to file my story, the main stories that I came there for, because I did a lot of interviews that <laughs> night. I was able to write about this one family and their celebration of of Christmas Eve. And unfortunately, I had started writing the story late that night, and they put my computer through some machine pretty much erased all the content on my screen. So I had to rewrite it furiously to, to make the deadline for Christmas. But anyway, that's the story of my deportation from Cuba. But it didn't sound like it was anything particularly spicy, the story. Just, yeah, were they just so paranoid about the, the American viewpoint? I suppose it was, it was very difficult times there, the relationships between the US and Cuba. I think being American alone probably led to that. Yeah, I don't know if it was so much a, a problem that I was an American. I think the problem was that I was writing stories that were not flattering to the government. And, and I know that because once I was, I'd written a story, I'd written a bunch of stories that were increasingly more critical of the of the government. And for example, I wrote a story about this elderly couple that had the first independent library where they circulated books that the government didn't approve of in Santiago de Cuba, which is the second largest city in Cuba in the East, and, and a bunch of other stories, including government farmers, independent farmers that refused to sell their produce to the government cooperatives. And so that was considered illegal at the time, I think. And to make a long story short, I was once hauled into state security headquarters. I was left a note telling me I had to be somewhere at a certain time. And and when I got there, after making me wait in front of their office for three hours, there was a lot of important looking large men with a paulettes on their shoulders and green military uniforms 
who described, who told me that they were like what we would say, what we would describe in our country as the FBI. And so I was like, oh, mucho gusto. <laughs> and <laughs> they, had, they had stories I'd written that were translated from English into Spanish. And they, I, I'll never forget the guy behind the desk as he was smoking a cigar and blowing the smoke in my face would pound on his desk and say, son mentiras, these are lies. And as he would read back some of my stories and he asked me why I wasn't visiting their beautiful beaches. And I assured him I would be happy to visit their beautiful beaches. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, it went south from there. Okay. Were these published in papers in Cuba or, or was this back in the States that you were publishing? It was back in the States. So it's yeah. actually where I started writing the Boston Globe. Yeah. And I think what actually initially sparked what got the attention of the Cuban authorities was I was writing for newspapers all over the United States as a freelancer. One of the newspapers I was writing for was the Miami Herald. And the Miami Herald, which is a great Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper, is also considered an enemy of the revolution, particularly during the days of Fidel Castro. And my agreement with the Miami Herald was that they wouldn't publish my byline in my in their in the stories. But one day, I think somehow they made a mistake and they published my byline. And after that, schoolboy, uh, I started, <laughs> schoolboy, I started to notice some strange things like the place where I was staying. You know, someone clearly had been <laughs> searching through my stuff and. Books that I had were not in the same place I had left them, all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, as mad that becomes a story in its own right. It seems like a scene from a James Bond movie, like that, that whole thing. <laughs> yeah, not quite as glamorous. I, I wasn't wearing, you know, Armani suits or, <laughs> you know, drinking martinis every half hour. But, <laughs> but there were a lot of beautiful women. <laughs> of course. Have you been back to Cuba since? Unfortunately, no. I was essentially told I couldn't come back. Although I, I hope the statute of limitations <laughs> now has expired because my wife and I have sometimes talked about going and maybe taking our kids. I think things are have eased up a bit now compared to how they were some years ago. But But my chief concern is that I get there. And especially if I go with my family, <laughs> yeah. and they send me. They basically send me away. So I don't know how to really test the waters <laughs> uh, without losing, you know, the losing a trip essentially. Probably, yeah, it's probably not worth it. But I think the there's always that should I test it. I think I, I would be tempted to go just to see what happens. But anyway, yeah, I, I will. I likely will at some point. Yeah, good, good. So how long have you been with the Boston Globe then, David? So I started writing for the Globe in the late 90s and then moved to Boston full time in in 1999 and mm. started and have been a staff writer there for years. But just last year, I actually took a job as a professor of journalism at Boston University. So I'm still writing for the paper, but now essentially have three jobs, which is <laughs> teaching and writing for the paper and making films. Yes, excellent. That's a, that's a fantastic trifecta. In terms of the stories that you, that you go after and you hunt out, what, have you naturally drifted towards some of the natural you know, world stuff, you know, the things to do with the fishing scene and stuff, or has that just been fortunate there's been a story there, or, or is it something that you're genuinely interested in? So... I've covered all sorts of things over the years, obviously started my career in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And after my deportation, I moved to Washington and began covering national security issues and covered the Pentagon for a while, covered the war over the former renegade Yugoslavian province, Kosovo. And, and then when I moved to Boston, I started covering, I, I covered, I've covered all different kinds of beats including academia and poverty issues, terrorism at the Boston Marathon. And, and I, I also covered 9-11, the attacks in New York City and Washington. And, and then eventually, as we began to notice our climate started changing in a very marked way, 
I began covering the environment. And for more than a decade now, I have covered all kinds of environmental issues for the Boston Globe. And the through line of that coverage has been climate change. Yeah, yeah. So some of your short films are, are, are fantastic. I think we'll come on to that because I'm not want to jump too too far ahead. If I could roll back and maybe ask you to maybe if you tell us a little bit about the, the Boston Marathons and the work you've done with the, the Richard families and their story. I think, is that the one that you won the, the Ernie Pyle Award for the coverage yes. on that? Could you just tell us a little bit about that, if you, if you don't mind? Sure. About now 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. I was on leave from the Globe doing something called a fellowship, a Neiman fellowship at Harvard University, where you get to study anything that you want at Harvard, essentially. And it was around that time that I was starting to be encouraged at the Globe to experiment using video with my stories. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take a class learning the grammar of filmmaking. And and for the final project for that class, I was making a short film about the first little person to run the Boston Marathon. I'd run the Boston Marathon several times and had written stories because I was just really drawn to the marathon. For years, I would write a sort of a setup story for the paper about the upcoming marathon and and I spent a few months filming this amazing young woman as she aspired to be the first little person to complete the Boston Marathon. And, and then on the day of the marathon, I was with her from very early in the morning as she was getting up and getting ready. And then I traveled with her on the bus out to the starting line and then got a ride to the halfway point where I tried to film her and then to the finish line where I was waiting for her to cross and have this historic triumphant ending of this short film project that I was working on. And as I was standing on the finish line waiting for that moment, all of a sudden a bomb exploded about 15 to 20 steps from where I was standing. And then, and then a second bomb exploded and if you've ever seen any of the footage of the aftermath of the bombings, you've probably seen some of my footage from that day. And I wrote a story about an eyewitness account for the paper and decided to spend the next year essentially covering the aftermath of that very terrible moment and how it affected so many people in our city. And and there was one family that was likely affected more than just about any other family in our city. And it was this family, the Richards, and they lost their eight-year-old son to one of the bombs, their seven-year-old daughter at the time, who I recently actually just had a Zoom call with, and I'm helping her with her college essay. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> college, and we've kept in touch all these years. The seven-year-old daughter lost her leg. The older brother, who was 11 at the time, physically was fine, but has had to live with what he witnessed. The mother lost an eye and or was blinded in one eye and the father lost some of his hearing. And so I spent about six months following with them, following them leading up to the first anniversary and, and wrote a long moving narrative about their experience, their journey throughout that year and and back essentially to 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 the marathon where they decided to essentially try to turn this horrible experience into some something good by giving back to the community that gave a lot to them that's that's a fantastic piece of work not just for you know the fact as a journalist and and you know, it's a piece of content, but I think the emotional side to it and the fact that it has kind of stuff forward and just to hear that that, that you're still in touch with the, the daughter and, and helping all these years later is, is, is really something, David. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. How was that? It must have been fairly emotional for everybody involved in that throughout that year. How did that take its toll on you as a, as a journalist? Because you obviously must have had to navigate some tough boundaries and stuff throughout that how was it 
Yeah, no, it was an incredibly difficult story to cover. I often, when I recount that story, still have to fight back tears. It left a deep imprint on me and and on our city. And for me, it also led to my first films. And I made a short film initially called 25.7 in Twice the Steps, which was about the subject of my stories, uh, of my short class project it was sort of what what became of her experience and and then i continued to follow her because that story that film didn't quite have the right ending and and that led to my first feature film when i actually ran the marathon the next year with the subject of the film and nearly collapsed at the end after carrying a camera the entire way. And and it, that film was about her experience, but also about the city coming back. And that was called Undaunted. And and the short, short answer to your question is that it was an incredibly uh, difficult year. But for me, uh, telling stories and telling the stories of of how people came together, how people were coping with their injuries, how people, you know, the investigation and the arrests of, mm. of at least one of the, and the trial of one of the suspects, all of those things came together for me as a way of really dealing with the trauma that I experienced. And I think by being able to tell other people's stories, by being able to serve some role in our community way for me to deal with that experience and help me heal, I think. Mm, fantastic. How how has the community in it and how has it been received? So that piece of work and considering you know we're t- 10, 11 years on or whatever, 10 years on from it now. So how 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 is the city first of all when it comes to the, the anniversary of the marathon? Is it seen as a bit of a you know it it must be difficult, kind of, especially, yeah, how is the city, really? I think the city is strong, and, you know, time heals a lot of wounds. There are obviously things that will never heal, mm. uh, including the very real physical wounds that uh, many people have to live with from that day, but things change, and relationships really grew in a lot of ways out of that experience. And I think it's a different city than it was that day, but it also, for me, you know, I don't know what it's like in Scotland when you go to a different city, but in the States, sometimes there are cities that are very accepting. I grew up in New York and you're in New York for five minutes and you're a New Yorker. In in Boston, you can live here for a decade and never be a Bostonian. Mm. And it wasn't in some ways until that day that I really felt like this was my city, that this was my home, that this mm. was, you know, a place I belonged. Mm. Oh, amazing. So just closing this out, then on, on reflection, if, if there's one thing you would like people to, to take away from your work, with, you know, on that day and what you've done with the Richards family and stuff, what would that be? Oh, I don't know how to reduce it to just one thing. And that's fine. I think that's fine. Yeah. I I just say that, you know, there are a lot of people who are living with that day as people all over the world, unfortunately, live with the, the impacts of terrorism or violence. And, and for me, I had an upfront seat to how some of the bravest people have dealt with some of the most searing pain. And that's probably what I'm most impressed by and what I'm in awe of in some ways. Thank you. Yeah, th- thank you. I think, you know, it's an incredible story, some incredible work. You've done it, you've done it justice. And obviously the, the recognition and validation through the industry and, and the Ernie Pearl Award kind of uh, speaks volumes uh, for that. And I, I recommend that people check it out if they haven't already. Moving on, so some of the other work that you've done, I wanted to touch on the Entangled movie, which actually won the Jackson Wilde Award. And for those that, again, may, may not appreciate that, well, it's deemed the, the Oscars for the kind of natural world, really. So it's quite a prestigious recognition for that. 
Do you want to talk us through what, what inspired you to, to delve into that story about the, the plight of the North Atlantic right whales? Sure. So a few years ago, the United Nations released this report that was really mind-blowing. It suggested that by the end of this century, we are likely to lose more than a million species. And and I wrote a front page story at the Globe about this report, but the words on the page didn't seem to somehow match the enormity of its findings. And I began to think, how in the world do you tell a story about that magnitude of loss? And I started to think maybe you can tell that story through one species, one species that people, human beings seem to identify with, the so-called charismatic megafauna, like a great whale. And, and I also, around that time, was writing quite a bit about the plight of the North Atlantic right whale, which inhabits the waters off of the coast of New England and where I live. And the numbers were plummeting. And, and a lot of scientists have feared and still fear that the, this great whale was on uh, a path toward extinction if we did not do something to change that. And, and I started to learn a lot about the causes of the premature deaths of these whales. And, and one of the leading causes of that was entanglement in fishing lines, and particularly the fishing lines that come from one of our country's most valuable fisheries, the lobster industry. And there are literally millions of these vertical buoy lines, the lines that go from the traps at the bottom of the of the sea to the buoys at the surface. And these lines were entangling lots of these whales and other marine mammals, either seriously injuring them or killing them. And, and so I started to learn more about this conflict and thought this would be a good way to tell a story that we're likely to see more of, which is about a conflict between a vital conservation concern and a vital commercial interest and how our federal government and state governments are trying to navigate that tricky balance. The, the short film, I think the, the stats at the time were something like 400 whales ex- in terms of the population expecting the re- I think projection that they would be potentially extinct mm-hmm. within 20 years. I think in, in my research in prepping for, for the show that looks at that is actually happening already. There's, you know, I, th- I think it's dropped down to just over 300. There's about 70 presumed reproductive females in the waters at the minute. So I think that documentary is actually unfortunately coming to, to, to bear. Now, what's your... You know, what's your views on it? How, how was the documentary be? Because, sorry, let me back up. I know that there was some conflict between the fisheries and the conservationists and stuff. What was your experience of that in creating the film? Oh, there's no question that there's very heated conflict. And since the film was broadcast, I have felt that that tension as well. I have had death threats sent to me and and... Lots of anger. There was the lobster industry tried to create this this repost to the film Entangled, which they titled "The Weaponization of the Right Whale," and suggesting, you know, that our film was unfairly sullying the lobstermen. When I think our film went out of its way to be fair-minded and reflect on the potential dangers of overregulation or the potential dangers of any regulation and impact on fishermen we you know it, it's tricky because i don't think anybody here wants to see the demise of this vital part of our economy this you know very long historic tradition of of fathers sons and now daughters and mothers 
lobstering. It's a part of our culture here. And I certainly don't want to see that end. The issue is how do you stop the damage from these vertical buoy lines to our our great whales that you know we they're on, on our license plates here in Massachusetts, and it's just you know this species that I don't think anybody, including the lobstermen, want to see disappear. Yeah, because I think the, the impact in the wider ecosystem is should not be misunderstood. You know what, what these these animals contribute to, to the ecosystem in, in terms of that that cycle. You know, who knows Absolutely. if they go and extinct, what would happen in the next five and ten years? What would that do to the lobster population potentially? So there's got to be an open line of communication, and it just seems that both sides, unfortunately, because because this is the same in, in fishing waters across the world, isn't it? I think you also done a, a piece on the conflict between the US and the, and Canada over 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 the waters. I think the you know. There's always an argument on both sides, but it's trying to find a, a middle ground to have these parties have a constructive dialogue to find a way forward. And all the while, yeah. since you were filmed, it looks like that isn't really happening. And unfortunately, that you know those right whales are are at greater risk of extinction. Yeah. Absolutely right. So from that. Again, a similar question. What, what, what would you, if you had an ask for people that that have watched that or are interested in the conservation without getting into conflict, is is there anything that people can do to to help that plight somehow, or are we just at the mercy of nature? Yeah, just today, as it happens, you know, I think a lot of public pressure on the federal government to do to take action has led to new efforts to try to protect the right whale and i i just wrote a little something on twitter about how the federal government today just announced an historic amount of money 82 million that they have set aside to try to promote the protection of north atlantic right whales and that is i think partly from all the pressure and the reporting on the plight of the North Atlantic right population. When I first started making the film in 2019, there was an estimated, I think, 419 right whales. The last estimate was fewer than 340. We'll get an updated estimate in the next few weeks as to the ultimate, what the population is today. Uh, But there are, as you said, I think fewer than 70 breeding females. So the, mm. so there's a lot of significant dangers to the species, but there, this massive amount of funding will hopefully help and create, lead to new technologies that will make it unnecessary to use vertical buoy lines. And that's the hope. Excellent. Do you feel that you've contributed towards that? You've left a mark on how the, the government have responded? I hope so. Yeah, it looks like it. it. Looks like it. Along the same theme with whales, in the whale, the film, the story of Michael Packard. I can't believe that actually happened because there's many fables and old tales about this happening, but this actually happened, and you've created a short film around it. Do you want to give us a quick synopsis and tell us about that? Sure. No, it's actually a feature film. Feature oh, length film, I think. Yeah. You might have seen just yeah, sizzle for the film. Yeah. But yeah, next in a couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing a film, two films actually, that I've been working on for the past two years. And one of them is this amazing story about the last remaining Cape Cod lobster diver, who commercial lobster diver, who two summers ago on his third dive of the morning was heading down to search the bottom of the sea for lobsters that he grabs with his hands and puts in a lobster bag. When all of a sudden his world went completely black and he was swallowed or engulfed in the mouth of a humpback whale and was inside this humpback whale for, for nearly a minute and saw his life pass before his eyes. And, uh, and then he was spat out, literally sort of 
thrown out at the surface and because of all the air pressure that that expanded in his dry suit literally shot out fins first into the <laughs> air according to the eyewitnesses and and so i spent the last two years r- making a film about what happens to a human being who experiences one of the most frightening things that can possibly happen to anyone and and who gets thrust into the international news media and and how he sort of comes back from that and deals with that as the limelight fades. Um, And that's just a crazy story. And then another film actually that we're about to release next month is, is another, another film about climate change. And this film is about, about how one city decided one city that probably has more climate scientists per capita than any other city on the planet decided to build an entirely new urban district at sea level, on landfill, hard on the coast, and arguably because of the way gravity works in the bullseye of rising sea level. And it was all built. And this city is my city, Boston, which despite having, you know, all our scientists at Harvard, and MIT, and at Boston University and elsewhere, many of these people, you know, telling the city it might not be wise to spend billions of dollars building an entirely new urban district, uh, and yet uh, we did, and we're still doing that. And and there are no real defenses against the rising seas at this point. That's a follow that the money story. Yeah, that, that's a follow the um, money story if I've ever I've heard it. <laughs> yeah, and the, the film raises the question of, you know, who, it's a film ultimately about environmental justice and uh-huh. who should have to pay to defend this city, this neighborhood that was built well after we all knew about the dangers and who should eventually have to pay when uh, the ultimate flooding comes. Uh-huh. So those two films, David, where because I did I haven't been able to see in the wheel yet. So has that not been screened publicly? Or yeah, or, or is it coming? What what's the status on that? So in the whale will be uh, released. So we did have one public screening so far, and that was at the Provincetown Film Festival on mm-hmm. Cape Cod, and that was a few months ago, and that was a work in progress screening. Mm-hmm. Okay. The, actual full film will be released at the New Hampshire Film Festival in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in in less than a month. Ah, uh, well, good. Okay. And I'll put so in the chat here the link to the for listeners they can watch the sizzle and see more about the film <laughs> and we'll eventually be bringing both of these films to hopefully an international audience. So oh, anyone in Scotland wants to fly me over, I'm happy to talk <laughs> about other films. Yeah, excellent. That's, yeah. That might be an option. I can think of if I have got an idea of some some cracking venues potentially. How you know, come to the climate change one in a minute, but how did you film it? I just say one thing yeah. there is a Scotland Scottish part to inundation district. So I went to Glasgow for oh, the film when COP twenty six was there. And so spent a good uh-huh. good amount of time. And there are two scenes from Glasgow in Inundation District, which is the name of the film about the impact of rising seas on Boston. The film well, that neighborhood uh-huh. was dubbed Innovation District, and we have renamed it the Inundation District. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Glasgow's my home city. That's where I'm sitting at this moment in time. Did you spend much time here or was it a flying visit? It was quick and it was mostly centered around covering COP26. But I did get around and got to take some morning runs through the this beautiful park in the center of Glasgow where there are all these bridges over this river and castles and i, yeah. I was very impressed yeah excellent well we, the city is full of parks it's uh it's a, an old victorian uh thing it's very, yeah it's a very beautiful yep. city 
Excellent. Uh, and in terms, so back to what was the name of the the, the film about you. climate change and and the the work in in Boston? In terms of what's what the future holds, have you got any other projects or stories of interest that you're that you're looking forward to working on that you can share? Uh, so right now I'm just trying to get these two films over the finish line. We're close and doing some final work on each of them. And so my project is just bringing these films into the world over the coming months. But I've also been working on children's, two children's books. Uh, and one of them is about climate change. And, and it's all about, it's a book based on the true story of my six-year-old son discovering a cold stunned sea turtle on a beach on Cape Cod. And, and we are increasingly having these endangered sea turtles known as Kemp's Ridley sea turtles wash up on our shores around the in late fall as our summers last longer and the waters stay warmer longer and the turtles don't have the same signals that they used to have to go back when they and head south when they were supposed to and then they essentially get stunned by this sudden onset of cold temperatures and that often makes it difficult for them to swim and they get uh, forced onto the beaches. And so I am working on and illustrating a, a children's book called Lost and Found, all about my son's experience rescuing a sea turtle. Ah, interesting. When do you hope to release release that? I We're about midway through illustrating the books, hoping next year. Ah, good. Excellent. Good luck. Good luck with that. Keep, keep us Thank posted. You. Yeah, I've got a little girl as well. She and she's a keen, avid reader at the moment. I'd be keen to check that out. Sounds uh, great. Yeah, good, good. Right. So, I think connection is is coming back. Are you okay to come back on camera just for the two final closing parts, uh, David, and then we'll be wrapping up? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just thought it would maybe be better for the connection. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. Good. So as we're kind of coming up on time, David, we've got two closing traditions that we do on the show. One is the call to adventure uh, and the final one is the pay it forward. So the call to adventure is all about your opportunity to suggest, you know, an adventure activity, a place or a trip or a person, so just something for people to, to get involved in, and, you know, disconnect from the screen and do something a bit more adventurous. So what would your call to adventure suggestion be? So one of my favorite things in the world to do is to swim in waterfalls. And and I love whenever I'm traveling to find a hike that ends with a waterfall and a pool and, and just hang out with the cold water sort of giving you a nice shower. It's the best way to end a hike. And I have seen many beautiful places and those are often the most beautiful to me. A place where you can sort of just, not just admire the beauty, but actually feel it, feel the beauty mm. would be my call to adventure. Fantastic. Do you have a favorite waterfall that comes to mind anywhere in the world? There's one that I guess I'm thinking of, which is in the Dominican Republic. And I said I had access to horses and motorcycles and we would sometimes take the motorcycle to a horse and there was this waterfall called Salto Baguate, I think. And it was, there was nobody there and it was just this green, tropical green water and the water was really warm and and it was just like it was so easy to swim into and really beautiful i also remember going to one in thailand where there was like a series it was a hike in near chiang mai in the north of thailand and it's a national park and there's like a series of seven or so waterfalls and it's just a really beautiful place mm, fantastic yeah 
Uh, we've got a plethora of waterfalls and, and plenty of cold water in, in Scotland. Uh, phenomenal. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. So finally, the, the pay it forward. So that's all about anything, any worthy causes, charitable or otherwise, that are important to you when we want to raise awareness of. So what would your pay it forward suggestion be? Um, something specific or something general? Whatever, whatever that means to you. So something specific, my, my wife runs this wonderful organization where she brings together kids from all over Boston and gets them to do something that they never thought they could do, which is to complete this, this race. And in a couple of weeks, her annual 5k is coming up and she, and she just brings together community and she gets people to dream of things that, you know, to do things that they only dreamed of doing and, and or never thought they could do. So that's something specific and wonderful. The other is, is to not become complacent and recognize that our, this summer, we have seen how our many years now of pumping fossil fuels into our atmosphere is radically changing our environment. And, and we've seen evidence of that for years, but this summer, I think the dangers from the floods, you know, just in the past week in Libya to the fires in in Hawaii, to the wildfires all over Canada, Western Canada, the unbelievable deluge of rain in Southern Europe, whether in Greece, and the, the pictures are just absolutely astonishing. The, the record heat that we've seen throughout Europe, particularly in Spain this summer, the North Atlantic, the waters of the North Atlantic Ocean have never been warmer, off the charts warm. And it is it is quite frightening to see and we can't become complacent we need change indeed very important thank you thank you so that brings us to, to the the end that's been a fantastic conversation it's we've covered various angles and facets of your your life in journalism and, and document and film and film and documentaries and stuff so i really thank you for for your time today David, that's been it's been inspirational and phenomenal. Thank you, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you for taking the time uh, to share my story. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com/podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small, because sometimes. We all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward.